So when I quit school in high school with about six months left, yes, you heard that correctly, I used to make wonderful decisions. <laughs> when I quit high school with about six months left, with a man who promised me $300 a week working at a cotton gin, I thought, my God, $300 a week? I could be rich. You know how it is when you think, when you're young, young people, listen to me. I love you and the Lord, but you've got no sense. You're not fully cooked yet. You're not. I want you to do me a favor and stay in school and get you a good education. Right? Stay in school and get you a good education. Don't quit like I did. Right? I quit and I, I saw $300 a week, man, and I jumped on that. And after I jumped on that, how do you know that it's good $300 a week? It was, was okay about uh, close to 30 years ago. Right? But how do you know that picking cotton is seasonal? Young people, that's, that's the problem. With you, you have no vision. All you see when you're not fully cooked is the here and now. You, you want instant gratification. It's got to happen right now. And that's why, that's why God gave you people with gray hair, right, in your life to say, cool your jets. Hold on. Easy. Because people with gray hair have vision. How many of you know 60-year-old eyes see better than 30-year-old eyes? 60-year-old eyes see better than 30-year-old eyes. You can see things differently when you get older. I couldn't see. I had no vision. All I thought about was the here and now. Then the cotton, you know, you can't pick cotton year-round. $300 a week doesn't last year-round. $300 dropped to $150. $150 dropped to $75. $75 dropped to nothing. Then you're sitting around going, now what? What do I do now? And I thought, I better go to school, right, and get some sort of an education. So here we are, Alabama, 49th in the nation in education, and I go to a community college in Enterprise, Alabama, and go in there and sign up to take college classes. Well, they said, if you're going to take college classes here, we'll need to know where to place you. So here's a math test. Take this math test and we'll see where we can place you in math. Here's a blank piece of paper. Write an essay on this blank piece of paper so that we can determine just how lingual you are so we'll know where to place you. Well, they gave me the math test. I've always been pretty good with numbers. Wonderful. Got to go into math 101. They read my essay and they're like, no. <laughs> Reading is just not one of my things. You know what I'm saying? It has become one of my things as you grow and you understand that you get. Now, when I, now I've got more degrees than a thermometer. I read a lot. But then I didn't read so much. So they read my essay and they're like, no. You're not going into English 101. You're going into English 091. We're going to put you in remedial English so that you can learn something. How many of us humiliating? But you got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. So I say that as an introduction to today's sermon. You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere now look if you're God and you're starting a new covenant or a new agreement with your people what are some of the first things that you tell your students your people what's the what's the first thing that's going to come out of your mouth as you're introducing the gospel or the good news to your people What's the first thing that's going to come out of your mouth in the New Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. Those scriptures are going to be on the board for us today. We can read them together. They're found in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. 
I'll be reading out the NASB here on the screen. You can read out the translation of your choice. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all of the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I. And I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Praise God for the word of the Lord today. Well, let's pray and we'll unpack that. Father, thank you. For the wonderful privilege of preaching the gospel in front of your people. Father, I'm under no illusion today. These are sheep in your pasture. I'm your messenger. I am here to deliver to them the word of the Lord. Help me do that in a way that impacts them today. I ask that in Jesus' name and the people of God. Said amen. Well, the first thing I want you to know, if we can pull those scripture verses back up, starting all the way back in verse 1. First thing I want you to make aware of that God is starting out here with, as far as trying to teach us something, is I want you to look at verse 2. It is written. The first thing that the Lord God wants you to know is that the Word of God has got authority. Let me say that again. The Word of God has got authority. Do you want to know why our society is coming unraveled at the seams? It's because no one respects authority anymore. That's the problem. We have taken the Bible out of every area of our social life. There's no longer a standard anywhere. There's no longer any place for anybody to go through and say exactly what is authority. We have taken away the authority from the Word of God. We've taken the authority away from God. And we've put that authority on ourselves. And now we're the arbitrator of morality. We determine what's authority. We determine what's right. We determine what's wrong. It's like we're returning back to the days of the Old Testament where everybody did right in their own eyes. Don't you know that that is going to lead us and our society into destruction. That's why I preach as hard as I do about you getting out of this stuff. And to flee from all of this stuff. Because it is going to fall. And you better have your hope and faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. And not in these world systems. Can I get a witness in the house today? There's got to be some authority. Just this past week, I received an email from the superintendent of North Carolina schools. I'm sure much of you, many of you in here did the same. They told me in that email that they wanted us to be more kind. And that they wanted us as educators, influencers, leaders in the community to be more kind. And to teach kindness. Now I'm all for that. But there's one thing that they're missing. <laughs> they took the word of the Lord out. Now everybody's going nuts. Follow me. They took the word of the Lord out of the school. Now everybody's going nuts. Now they're trying to introduce kindness into the hearts of people. <laughs> you can forget that. Do you know what the human heart wants? Not kindness, meanness. That's
that's what's inherent in a fallen heart. Have we forgotten the fruits of the Spirit? One of the fruits of the Spirit is kindness. So you take the one who gives you kindness, kick him out of all of society, and then say, I want you to be kind. (laughs) It's a joke. Now, I, I appreciate them trying to do that. But when the human heart has not been visited by the Lord Jesus. Come on, somebody. When the human heart has not been visited by the Lord Jesus, you can't be kind. Well, you can be kind as long as people are kind to you. But hey, let somebody curse you. Let somebody use you. Let somebody do something wrong to you. Now let's see, baby, what kind of kindness you got. Because I got a feeling it ain't going to be too kind. The only thing that's going to restrain the madness of a man or a woman is the power of God. That's the only thing we got. Do you know that we got a thing around here in our society called Throat Punch Thursday? The only thing that keeps Christians... From throat punching somebody on Thursday is the Holy Ghost. Right? It restrains the madness of a man. So the first thing that the Lord wanted us to learn from him in the classroom, the first thing that he wanted to introduce to us was that the word of God matters. Can I get a witness in the house? Next thing that the Lord wants us to know is, Behold, I send my messenger Ahead of the Lord. Can I let you in on a little secret? The Lord God will always give you a heads up that something's coming. You need to listen to me. The Lord God will always give you a heads up that something's coming. I don't care. Listen. Now we think of that and we say, well, it's got to be a prophet. Somebody's got to come and go and get before us and go, oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, I feel God. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit, and He's on me, and I have a word for you. No, that's weird. Okay, you get in front of my face doing that, I'm going to have to say, listen, you take that word elsewhere, because I'm not listening to that. Okay? I'm talking about really prophetic stuff. How many of you know God can use a TV show to speak to you? He can use music to teach to you. He can use secular things to teach you. He can use all kinds. He can use your children to talk to you. Hey, we don't give our kids credit enough. This is our five-year anniversary here. Kristen and I knew something was up. We sensed in our spirit that God was up to something and that there was possibly a move impending To North Carolina. We were riding down the road. Had my little daughter, my oldest one, the one that Kristen is going to go pick up now. She's in the back seat. She's 13 now. Five years ago, she was about five, if I've got my math right. (laughs) Eight, I know, I'm joking with you. Gospel 101. <laughs> She's in the back seat and she goes. And, and listen, and we kept, we was like keeping this stuff under wraps, right? Out of nowhere, she's in the back. She goes, are we moving? I thought, Lord God. He knows. An eight-year-old kid knew. God will give you a heads up that something's about to change in your life if you'll listen. It might be a still, small voice. It might be somebody like me who's loud and proud getting in your face. I don't know what means the Lord will use. He's got a lot of them. But I do know this. He will always give you a heads up. If you're listening, He'll always give you a heads up that a change is coming 
in your life. God has got you. You may be in a season of change right now. That's totally fine. That just means God's got you right where he wants you. Amen? So that's something else I wanted you to know here in Gospel 101. The word of the Lord is important. It is written. It's got authority. Number two, God will always give you a heads up that something is coming your way. Number three, I want you to look at this. The Bible says that this was one crying in the wilderness, the voice of one crying in the wilderness saying, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Go to the next slide for me. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin and all of the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. This is the third thing the Lord wants us to know about the gospel. The Lord is unconventional. Let me say that again. The Lord is unconventional. In other words, now unconventional is a big old college word. Let me break that down for you. In other words, God is going to do things that doesn't make sense to you. God is going to do things that don't make sense to you. The first thing he's going to do is he is going to bring a madman. Can we go to the next slide? Let's look at this dude. Clothed with camel's hair. I mean, that's worse than wearing Chuck Taylor's on stage. Clothed with camel's hair, he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate bugs and honey. This is not the guy that you pick to start the New Testament. Do you hear me? But this goes back to this understand God is unconventional. He doesn't use conventional means to get his message across to people. God will use a dude that walks around in camel's hair and wears a leather belt and eats honey and bugs, screaming like a madman. He will not, I'm not saying he won't, but typically he's going to use someone that you don't think he should use. Like a high school dropout redneck from Alabama. I am not the test case of someone that somebody would use to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. you got to understand that. I'm the person you don't pick. When you want to start the gospel of Jesus Christ, you go get someone who's really slick. You understand what I'm saying? At least six foot two. Right? At least six foot two. One of these guys that's in his 60s that never grays. And his hair never falls out. And he doesn't have a pop belly. And he wears everything just right on stage. You understand what I'm saying? He's got a little bit of growth but not a whole lot. You know the look. He's got a rip in the knee of his jeans. He's just perfect. That's the guy you pick to further the kingdom of God. That's the, that's the guy. You don't go get a wild man who hangs out in the woods and hunts and kills stuff and then gets in front of people and talks about it. That's not the guy you pick. You pick someone who's weird. And that's what God does. He uses weird things to get his message across to you. Could it be that God has to do that because we're thick? We don't listen good. God has to use weird ways to get his point across to us because we just are not in tune with his spirit like we should be. I'm just spitballing here. And then look at what God does. He's unconventional. Not only does he choose a weird dude from out of the woods. What does he do? He keeps that weird guy out in the wilderness. Now listen. If you're going to do something with the gospel, right? You don't go off into the rural areas, not in the way we think. If you're going to start the gospel, right? Where do you start? You start in a huge city where there's millions of people. That's where you start. You don't start out in the wilderness. Come on, somebody. 
You don't start out in the wilderness and holy cow, make people walk to you? You mean I got to I got to walk out there to hear this guy? You mean I got to get in my car and drive? He won't come to me. You mean I actually have to do something in the kingdom of God? Yeah. So here's a guy who's weird, who's hanging out in the wilderness, making you go out to him. And then when you do get out there to see him, you know what he tells you to do? (laughs) Repent. (laughs) This is not the way you start the gospel, Steve. But this is the way the Lord works. He picks a weird dude, keeps him out in the wilderness, makes you go see him. And then when you go out there to see him and you hear the gospel preached, he tells you to stop what you're doing and to act act right and, and perform a righteous life. It's a wonder this thing started at all. And yet people were flocking to him. God's unconventional. People were flocking to him. And they were being baptized in the Jordan River. Now it seems like to me that baptism should be an important part too. If God's going to introduce the gospel to us, one of the first things he tells you to do is to get baptized. Well, Pastor John, are you telling me that I got to be baptized in order to be saved? No, I'm not. Because the Bible clearly says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you make baptism a mandatory part of being saved, now all of a sudden it becomes works-based. you got to do something in order to earn it. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is you freely believe and He freely gives to you. That's the gospel. But that doesn't mean that you're exempt from being baptized. And here's just a theological difference between FAM Church and other churches. Is that here we're going to practice just like John the Baptist did in the Jordan River. Baptism by immersion. That's what we do here. I've seen pictures, um, prints, paintings of Jesus and John the Baptist standing In the Jordan River, John with his hands cupped, sprinkling water over the top of Jesus' head. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Sorry. Jesus went under the water, completely submerged, and come out of the water. And when he went in the water and came up out of the water, praise God, you know what happened, don't you? The Holy Spirit fell upon him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God for that. Now, God's unconventional. He wants you to be baptized. He wants you to believe in the Word of God. He wants you to do some of these things. Now look here. John the Baptist says of Jesus, He's mightier than I am. And I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong on his sandal. What does he mean by that? He means by that that the church needs to understand hierarchy in the church. We need to understand order in the church. We need to understand honor in the church. There is one coming after me who is mightier than I. Brothers and sisters, just as we have forgotten the importance of authority we've also forgot the importance of honoring one another come on somebody we have forgotten the importance of honoring one another I don't know about you but I was raised in an environment where you could disagree with someone but you respected them oh my lord let me go down this road just a little bit can I Nowadays, everybody has to agree on everything. You're not allowed to think different. You're not allowed to be different. They want you to think the same way, talk the same way, do the same thing, all just like, and if you don't, then they're going to label you something. Whatever happened to agreeing to disagree? Whatever happened to living and let live? 
Whatever happened to honoring someone say, you know what? I don't necessarily agree with you, but I love you in the Lord. You can go on and believe that all you want. I'm going to go on and believe all this I want. But you know what? I want you at my house Friday night for supper. Why did it get quiet in here all of a sudden? Just because we disagree with people don't mean that we can't honor somebody. We still need to learn the principle of honoring we need to learn to honor up like authority. Nowadays, we don't even understand authority. Cop tells you to do something. You, you, who are you? Who are you to tell? Who do you think you are? Preacher gets up and preaches the word of God. How dare he? I'm offended. Well, suck it up. My job up here on a Sunday morning is not to, it's okay. It's all right. It's okay. My job is to give the word of the Lord to you. You do with it what you want to. If it offends you, hey, praise God. Then it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. Because I want to tell you the what, the word of the Lord is supposed to offend you. It's supposed to go against the grain. You're supposed to say, wait a minute. Knock it off, Pastor John. Quit saying that. Quit doing that. No, well, then listen. I have to do what the Word tells me to do. Because before the Lord gets in anybody else's face in here, He's going to come get in mine. And I'm going to tell you what. When He gets in my face, you can believe I'm going to give Him a good report. Because I've had people come to me all the time, Pastor John. Now, listen. I've got a visitor coming, please. <laughs> Could you please be on your best behavior? Could you please not say this? Could you please not say that? And I'm like, do you think I'm crazy? Listen, I love you in the Lord, but I'm going to preach what God gives to me. <laughs> so we honor up. We honor the man of God, not just me. Don't honor me. Honor the position. We honor our police. We honor those who is in authority above us. We need to relearn that. Jesus had a guy come to him one day asking him for a favor. He says, all you got to do is speak the word. The guy says, I myself am a man under authority and I've got people under me let me say that again I myself he tells Jesus am a man under authority and I've got people under me I tell that one to go and he goes and I tell this one to come and he comes Jesus says oh wait a minute this guy's got it figured out authority we honor up here's the part that I wish the church would get to we also honor down. Oh, I wish we could learn that. We honor down. Mel, it don't matter if they look like us. We honor them anyway. It don't matter if they make money or don't make money. Or they don't make as much as we do. We honor down. It don't matter what kind of job they got. Doesn't matter any of that stuff. Doesn't matter their social status. Doesn't matter any of that. We don't look down on people. We honor down. No matter what. People want to be high esteemed. I was pastoring in Florida. Had a couple show up in a white Cadillac. I'm never in the parking lot. Never on a Sunday morning. This Sunday morning I happen to be out there. A couple right up in a parking lot. We had a stick built building with wood then we had a metal gymnasium behind it people get out of the car they start walking towards the metal building I said excuse me ma'am sir I said uh, we meet over here in this building they stopped dead in their tracks they said you meet in that building I said yeah we meet in that building they got in their car and they left they only understood how to honor up Everything better be up to my standards or I don't belong. <laughs> the Word has got a word for you in that. The Lord has got a word for you in that. Do you hear me? 
We need to learn to honor up and honor down. God can meet in a church building. It don't matter if it meets your approval or not. A couple of believers get together. Hey, when two or more are gathered together in his name, there he is also. Yeah. So I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Next verse, please. I baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah. Forgive me for getting loud, baby, but hey, when you start talking about the Holy Ghost, I get worked up. Now, here's the thing. I know when you start talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost, people start losing it. Let's be honest. And the reason why people start to lose it when you start talking about the baptism in the Holy Ghost is because it's been perverted. It hasn't been done right. And when wildfires, what I call it, gets loose in a church and people start seeing it, they get turned off by it and they don't want to have anything to do with it. I got news for you. When I first come into the kingdom of God, that's what I was around. I was around wildfire. You'd walk into a church, you didn't know what was going to happen on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. Back then it was three full-blown services a week. How do you remember that? I didn't know, you didn't know what was going to happen from service to service. I've seen people bounce like a ping pong ball and never hit the pew. Land and bounce and go to the next one. Land and bounce and, and land in between the gaps as they made their way up here to the front. And then just when they finally got themselves up here to the altar, just fall out. Ah! And everybody going, what in God's name was that? Because the thing about it was, everybody's attention got off the Lord, which is where it's supposed to be in a church service, and it got on somebody, and it got on somebody's antics, and it showed off on people who would act out. One of the churches I pastored, that's what a woman done. She had to wait for that song when she got her favorite song going. <laughs> I knew it was coming, because that song touched her just right. Some of you may remember, I think I shared this one time before. She'd start in the back and you'd hear. Ooh. Ooh. Here she'd start. And I thought, oh God, not today. We got visitors. <laughs> Lord, I'm trying to grow this church and this woman's crazy. She thinks she's full of the Holy Ghost. I think she's full of Satan. And she'd start, and down the aisle she'd come. Everybody else was seated. Here she'd come. Oh, oh, down the middle aisle, and I'm like, oh my. Everybody stand and let's worship the Lord. Because I had to find some way of cutting that off because it was getting weird. And so what I'm saying is, is that the things of the Spirit have been perverted. They've been manipulated. They haven't been done right and in order. And people have seen the negative side of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it freaks them out. I'm here to declare to you today. As the lead spiritual overseer of this church. We're going to go after the things of the spirit. But it's going to be done right. It's going to be done in order. So that when we do see the things of the Holy Spirit in operation, people will be edified by that, lifted up by that, encouraged by that, challenged by that, moved by that, knowing that God is God and we're not. Because ultimately, the things of the Spirit is designed to get you out of yourself and on to God. 
It's the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that I'm after. You can take all the other stuff and put it on a slow boat someplace else. I want the authentic, wonderful move of the Holy Spirit in my life. Come on, somebody. Let's praise God today.